Thank you, Duane, for your kind words. And uh, I'm so thankful to the Center for Faith and Culture for this opportunity to deliver this lecture. And I'm also thank you to you uh, because you're here. And in spite of the uh, cold and wind weather, we know that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. But in being here tonight, you have gained some non-saving points uh, of reward. <laughs> Our topic tonight has to do with an evangelical assessment of uh, present-day Roman Catholic trends in the doctrine of Scripture. And uh, <coughs> I will be briefly highlight some of the main features of recent documents. Uh, so we'll be dealing with magisterial documents coming from the teaching authorities of the Roman Church at various levels papal pronouncements, council, uh, constitutions, <coughs> as well as more recent documents um, drafted and presented by theological commissions and the Pontifical Biblical Commission of uh, the Vatican. So dif uh, different uh, magisterial documents at different level of authority, but uh, <coughs> they will give us the opportunity to uh, map what is going on as far as the doctrine of Scripture in the Catholic Church. And in order to begin our journey, it is always important to uh, at least be aware of some of the background that um, went beyond what is the most significant document in the 20th century as far as the doctrine of Scripture is concerned, that is, the Vatican II uh, dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, that is the De Verbum, the word, word of God. But what happened at before Vatican II, <coughs> as far as the doctrine of Scripture is concerned, is very <coughs> important. Because one of the movements uh, that prepared, paved the way for the Second Vatican Council to be celebrated was the so-called biblical renewal within the Church of Rome. Vatican II was the result, the outcome of several movements um, happening, occurring within the, Catholic, the Church of Rome, preparing the way for the Church of Rome eventually to convene the Second Vatican Council. One of these movements was the liturgical movement a movement that led to a new appreciation for the necessity, the need for liturgical reforms or renewals in the Catholic Church. Another important movement was the ecumenical movement that contributed significantly to shaping the new ecumenical posture of the Church of Rome that was then <coughs> presented and argued for in the Second Vatican Council. But also the, um, the movement uh, in French called the Ressourcement, the attempt to go back to the patristic sources and to appreciate them afresh as part of the body of uh, teachings of the Catholic Church, preparing the way for an extensive use of the Church Fathers in the Vatican II documents. And in the context of this, these main movements, the biblical renewal was a contributor to the preparation of the Second Vatican Council. A new, renewed <coughs> emphasis on the, uh, the Bible and the need for the Church to be uh, the place, the home of the Bible, where the Bible could have been read, studied, and preached. So prior to the, to the Second Vatican Council, we have at least two important documents that help us to figure out what did happen before Vatican II addressed the issue of the doctrine of the Scripture. And uh, <coughs> there are two encyclicals, two papal pronouncements. As you know, the hierarchy of the magisterial authority of Roman documents depend on 
various factors, but the encyclical is the uh, one of the most one of the highest um, ways in which the Catholic Church speaks into doctrinal or doctrinal issues. Uh, Pope Leo XIII in 1893 issued this uh, important encyclical Providentissimus Deus, uh, in which basically uh, he outlined a view of scripture characterized very much uh, by a high view of inspiration a high view of inspiration. We can, you know, parallel this, these, uh, this document with what was going on as far as the evangelical theology is concerned of the day, with what B.B. Warfield and others were arguing in uh, the Protestant world, and over against the liberal reinterpretation of what inspiration meant as far as the inspiration of the Bible, and so the Catholic Church, Leo the Thirteen. Uh, sided with the more conservative, traditional uh, view of the inspiration of the Bible, having a high view of it, and also defending the historical reliability of Scripture over against the several attacks to its reliability coming from the more liberal accounts of the lack of reliability uh, with regards to the writings of Scripture. That was one step, important step, in the modern reassessment uh, of the doctrine of Scripture as far as the Church of Rome was concerned. Another important document, uh, almost 50 years later, was issued by another pope, Pope Pius XII, in 1943, during the Second World War. It is interesting to notice that right in that dramatic, tragic, tragic period, and an encyclical on the Bible was issued. And uh, this encyclical uh, was, uh, is considered as being the beginning of an opening door within Catholic magisterial circles for historical critical methods to be practiced and to be uh, accepted. So it is the beginning of the opening up of Catholic exegesis, Catholic biblical theology, and, uh, and, and therefore Catholic theology as a whole, the beginning of it, of the opening towards the acceptance and the practice of historical cri critical methods. Not as if uh, the Catholic Church endorsed 100% uh, the liberal um, understanding and practice of these methods, but mildly uh, and, and yet significantly opening up the way for the Catholic Church to endorse them. And so, Providentissimus Deus and Divino Afflante Spiritu, they both together form a kind of a track, dual track, on which the Catholic Church entered the 20th century as far as the doctrine of Scripture. On the one hand, the reiteration of traditional high views of Scripture and also the reinforced by the um, acceptance of the reliability of the accounts of the Bible, coupled with an initial progressive yet real openness towards modern uh, historical critical methods. And that was the what uh, um, uh, formed the background of the Second Vatican Council as far as the doctrine, doctrine of Scripture is concerned. When we come to Vatican II, one of the main documents of the Council uh, was um, specifically dedicated to the um, divine revelation, not, not exclusively on scripture, but on the, under the rubric of the wider, more general topic of divine revelation. The Council uh, issued this con uh, dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, and in that context we can see how these two tracks, 
uh, highlighted with the previous encyclicals, further developed, merged, and were articulated. So here is a way in which we can summarize the main structure, the main thought coming out of De Verbum, uh, indicating um, uh, the, the, the new or the development, the further developed um, evaluation and presentation of the Catholic doctrine of Scripture. Revelation is what is what comes first. It is God's disclosure of his person and will and the channels through which revelation comes to us, I'm of course summarizing the content of De Verbum, is twofold. The, the channels are dual, are two. On the one hand, there is scripture as the written record of divine revelation and on the other, although connected inherently, organically, and yet distinctively connected, there is tradition that is part of God's revelation and scripture is the written record of this bigger reservoir of divine revelation coming to us through scripture and tradition. We don't have time here to uh, analyze this development over the, against the background of the Council of Trent, which also dealt with the relationship between scripture and tradition, uh, but uh, the, uh, the basic uh, Tridentine teaching concerning the duality of the, of the channels or the means by which divine revelation comes to us was reiterated and perhaps even more intertwined uh, and there was this, this attention of Vatican II to further uh, interrelate um, the scripture and tradition as being the two arms, the two tools, the two channels by which divine revelation comes to us. And uh, um, also De Verbum uh, connects uh, scripture and tradition to the present day living office teaching office of the church so that divine revelation does not come to us directly but it, it is filtered through the written record of scripture and the oral ongoing tradition and traditions of the church ultimately being conveyed through the living teaching office of the church this is what actually uh, this is the place, this is the locus where divine revelation can be known, filtered through scripture and tradition, but ultimately being heard and accessible through the present day ongoing living uh, and teaching office of the church. For an evangelical reader and observer uh, of this uh, do Vatican II document, if, you want to, if we want to uh, summarize and uh, put all these things together, what comes out in terms of the way in which revelation comes to us is a somewhat of a puzzling, uh, difficult word to really assess and understand. Certainly there is scripture, Certainly there are traditions, there is tradition, and certainly these two are also intertwined with the magisterium of the church, so that the words of scripture are not really audible in themselves uh, because they are always accompanied with, preceded by, and followed by uh, the tradition of the church and ultimately conveyed through the magisterium of the church. Between revelation, between the input of revelation and the output, there is a process, a complex dynamics taking place that makes the di uh, divine revelation uh, in a way uh, interpreted by scripture, tradition, the magisterium, and the ultimate result is this, uh, what can be described as a, an evangelical puzzlement with regard to what actually, what is the output of the uh, official uh, Roman Catholic magisterial teaching. 
there is a disconnection in an evangelical understanding of it and some of the doctrines, some of the practices, some of the theological lines, trajectories coming out of the magisterium are difficult to be connected directly with scripture and the reason of this uh, difficulty uh, lies on the fact that the output as a complex process before becoming what it is. Instead of uh, having a linear uh, relationship that connects divine revelation and scripture leading to the teaching of the church under the, uh, the authority of scripture, revelation has a more complex process that filters it in order to get to the official teaching of the church and that makes it more difficult for a evangelical reader to understand. Uh, in terms of Vatican II, there was a pictorial presentation of the main uh, system or structure of the argument of Dei Verbum. In terms of the main contents of the uh, dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, we observe the, the presence of a triangular interplay between tradition, scripture and the magisterium. They are always intertwined, they are always connected, they are organically inherent in one another. And in this understanding, scripture uh, contains revelation, but does, is not a finalized, ultimate version, authoritative version of it. It is not, therefore, in number 9, paragraph 9, the Verbum claims that it is not from sc sacred scripture alone that the Church draws her certainty about everything which has been revealed. Because revelation comes to us from scripture, through scripture as well as thr through tr tradition leading to the official teaching of the Church. The certainty is not grounded on scripture alone. And you, you notice this expression, expression scripture alone, referring directly or indirectly to the uh, 16th century uh, controversy with the Reformation. It is not from scripture alone that the Catholic Church draws her certainty um, about everything which has been relieved. Because both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of devotion and reverence because they are the two uh, channels through which divine revelation can be known to the official teaching of the church that in turn makes it um, present to uh, the, uh, the church itself, the audience, the faithful. Now we now jump to um, a very significant, after, after Dei Verbum, um, we have a long period of relative silence of the Catholic Church on the topic of Scripture. Because the Council with Dei Verbum had in a way settled or resettled the Catholic doctrine and there was no, at least as far as the Catholic Church was concerned, no need to address the issue again. So we, after 50 years uh, after the Council, uh, Pope Benedict um, the 16th issued this post-synodical um, exhortation on the topic of the Word of God. That synod in 2009 was convened, the, the gathering of bishops from around the world, was gathered to talk about the importance of the Word of God. And as it is a traditional practice for the Catholic Church after a synod is celebrated and uh, papers are discussed and discussions take place within the uh, format of a synod, the Pope, after collecting all the materials and uh, uh, receiving all the uh, proceedings, he uh, reflects upon all that was said in the context of a synod and after a year or two he writes a post 
synodical exhortation, a final document uh, making sure to, um, un to, to take and to uh, appropriate for the Church the main content, contents and challenges and issues and points uh, having been generated in the context of the Synod. Now, in 2010, uh, Pope Benedict uh, issued this very important uh, document uh, called Playing with the Words of Vatican II Dei Verbum, the Word of God, now becoming the Word of the Lord. The Latin can allow you know, the both ways of expressing the same uh, expression, the Word of the Lord in this, uh, in this case. And um, <coughs> the document is a um, summary, first of all, a summary of Roman Catholic teaching on the Bible, what is very, very useful in uh, mm, Catholic magisterial documents is that, one of the things that is useful, uh, is that it, a document always provides a summary of what the Church has believed uh, that, uh, um, that far. And so, instead of jumping on the subject, uh, uh, forgetting or bypassing what has been said before, every document makes the effort of saying that is what we believe and we have believed so far. And then he moves on in presenting the further reflection. Uh, in particular, Verbum Domini <coughs> acknowledges the Vatican II dogmatic constitution on the Word of God as the paramount doctrinal reference for the Roman Catholic theology of the Word of God and sees itself in total continuity with the Council. What is most interesting is the relationship between the Word and the Bible that is envisaged in this uh, recent document. To start with, Verbum Domini claims that the Word of God, the Word of God, quote, precedes and exceeds sacred scripture. Nonetheless, scripture as inspired by God contains the divine Word. Now, these are very important uh, expressions of the Catholic a modern, present-day understanding. The Word of God is bigger than the Bible and it precedes the written record and also it exceeds it. The Bible is not co-equal with the Word of God. It is something that is preceded and it is followed, succeeded by the Word of God so that the relationship between the Word of God and the Bible is that the Bible contains the Word of God. There is the Bible and there is also a further word beyond the Bible that makes the Bible not sufficient on its own. Was, what is at stake here is not the divine inspiration of the Bible which Verbum Domini affirms at it, as it was affirmed by Leo the Thirteenth. What is at stake here is the sufficiency of, sufficiency of the Bible and its <coughs> finality. For Pope Ratzinger, the Bible is the Word of God in some sense, but the Word of God is bigger than the Bible. The latter, the Bible, contains the former, the Word of God, but the Word of God is not equated with the Bible. For Protestant readers especially, a comment is here in place. Liberal theology has developed its own theology of the Word, whereby the relationship between the Word and the Bible is thought of in dialectical and existential ways. In other words, for some versions of liberal theology, the Bible is a fallible testimony to the Word and it becomes the Word of God, if it ever becomes so, when the Spirit 
speaks through it. Now, <clears throat> the Roman Catholic version of the word Bible relationship is articulated in a different way. The premise is the same, that is, the Bible contains the word, but the outworking of the word comes through the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. The gap between the word and the Bible is not existential, but ecclesial. The church is the cradle of the word, both in its past and written form, the Bible, as well as in its ongoing utterances, the traditions. In this respect, Benedict XVI writes, I quote, The church lives in the certainty that her Lord, who spoke in the past, continues today to communicate his word in her living tradition and in sacred scripture. Indeed, the word of God given to us in sacred scripture as an inspired testimony to revelation, together with the church's living tradition, it constitutes the supreme rule of faith. Again, it is reiterated the Vatican II teaching whereby God's revelation comes to us through the Bible and the tradition of the church. And that relationship is organically presented as being um, undivi undivided and undivide undividable. The Bible is upheld but the Bible is always accompanied and surmounted by the wider, deeper, living tradition of the Church, which is the present-day form of the Word. Among other things, the means, this means that the Bible is not sufficient in itself to give access to the Word, and it is not the final norm for faith and practice. The issue at stake is not so much the inspiration of the Bible, which is maintained. The issue at stake is here the finality and sufficiency of the Bible that instead is in need of being supplemented by the tradition of the Church and ultimately through the catechism or the official ongoing teaching of the Church. Moving forward, 2012, the International Theological Commission, which is an official uh, theological commission uh, nominated by the Pope and working under the uh, rubric of the uh, Pontifical Congregation for Sacred Doctrine. And uh, two years after, the, the papal document on the Word of God, uh, this International Theological Commission issued a document entitled Theology Today, Perspectives, Principles and Criteria. And in this document, although the doctrine of Scripture is not the only topic that is dealt with, it is nonetheless one of those important issues that are studied. And in this document, what we are presented with is a, quote, living we view of the Word of God. What strikes an evangelical reader, first and foremost, is the prominent reference to the Word of God given in the document. In Catholic theology, the expression Word of God has a wide, elastic and dynamic meaning far beyond the boundaries and contours of the written word of the Bible. The document reminds that Christianity is not, quote, a religion of the book, end of quote, but a, quote, a religion of the word of God, end of quote. The former, the book, is a written and mute word, End of quote. The latter, the Word of God, is, quote, the incarnate and living Word. So a sharp 
distinction is made between the written word and the living word, as if the two could be possibly polarized. The Catholic word contains both the scriptures as an inspired testimony to revelation and, quote, the church's living tradition. And together, scripture and tradition constitute the supreme rule of faith. So it is a reiteration of the teaching that was uh, presented uh, at Vatican II in De Verbum, uh, reinforced with Verbum Domini, Pope Benedict XVI, and further reiterated in this subsequent document. There is also a chapter on the understanding of tradition as the Word of God. The idea of tradition is paramount for the document and is perhaps the highest indicator of what it means for a theology to be a Roman Catholic theology. Tradition is defined as a complex whole with various vital components. I quote, a constantly renewed study of sacred scripture. This is tradition. Liturgical worship. Attention to what the witnesses of faith have taught through the ages. Catechesis fostering growth in faith. Practical love of God and neighbor. Structured ecclesial ministry and the service given by the magisterium to the word of God. It is a huge complex understanding of tradition of which scripture is only one constitutive part but again not the final nor the most authority authoritative it is one among the many components of tradition itself the whole roman catholic church is inherently involved in tradition since this is an ongoing process it is not only a matter of books or docu past documents, but it is also part of the vital uh, process of the life of the church. In a sense, the church is also immersed in tradition and is in itself part of its unfolding. And because the church is so immersed in tradition, it cannot possibly be, be corrected by the scriptures. The scriptures are one component, but the church is also involved in the processing of tradition so that these dynamics ultimately presented by the official teaching of the church finds it difficult to be corrected by scripture alone. Since the Bible is part of tradition and the church is also part of tradition, the Bible is submitted to the tradition of which the church is the present day and living voice. In a telling statement, the document, this document says that, quote, Scripture is the first member of the written tradition. The first. So it, has, it is very important, highly acclaimed, recognized as paramount, but only in the sense that it is the first. But what follows is not what the Bible is, and what follows is also to be taken into consideration in grasping what it is for the Catholic Church to be under the rule of tradition and to be in itself part of that ongoing process. Implying, therefore, that there are other members of the same tradition which come after and which define tradition in as much as scripture. The difference is that the living voice of the magisterium has the last say, whereas the written one is just one of the past components of tradition. And uh, then there is a section on the relationship between theology and the magisterium, the official teaching of the church. 
It comes to, as no surprise to read that, quote, fidelity to the apostolic tradition is a criterion to, for Catholic theology. While research is encouraged in all directions, descent towards the magisterium has no place in Catholic theology, end of quote. The magisterium has been given the, quote, charisma veritatis certum, that is, the sure charism of gift of truth, to which theology must submit. So this is another stepping stone in the formative process of the present day doctrine and practice of scripture in Catholic theology. Vatican II, Verbum Domini, this document by the International Theological Commission. The present day Pope, Pope Francis, in 2013, uh, delivered a speech to the Pontifical Biblical Commission that is not to be confused with the International Theological Commission. These are two separate bodies, one dealing with more theological, general theological issues. This one, the Pontifical Biblical Commission, dealing with uh, issues related to the Bible, Bible interpretation, and so on. And in meeting this commission, the members of this commission, Pope Francis gave this address on, the, on April the 12th of 2013. After commending the commission for the choice of the topic that we will refer to in a moment, and that had to do with the inspiration and the truth of the Bible, the Pontifical Biblical Commission had gathered to discuss the topic of the truth and the inspiration of the inspiration and the truth of the Bible. After commending the commission for the choice of the topic, the Pope highlighted the nature of Scripture and its relationship to the Word of God. The Bible, according to Francis, is, quote, the testimony in written form to the Word of God. Scripture is not associated with the Word of God uh, on a one-to-one on -one basis, but is rather perceived as a witness to something coherent yet different. Following this comment, the Pope adds that, I quote, the Word of God precedes and exceeds the Bible. These are words used by Benedict XVI, repeated by Pope French, Francis precedes, exceeds the Bible. The Word of God is bigger. In other words, the Pope does not endorse an identity view between Scripture and the Word, but supports a dynamic view of the relationship between the Word of God and the Bible, whereby Scripture witnesses to a Word that is before and beyond the Bible. The Word is present in the Bible, but not confined to it. The Word is spoken and told by the Bible, but the two do not coincide. Being that the Bible is only a partial witness to a much fuller Word. According to this view, what the Bible says is what the Word says, but what the Word says is not necessarily what the Bible says. The word is bigger. So what the Bible says is what the word says. But what the word says is not necessarily what the Bible says. Francis rightly recognizes that the center of the Christian faith is a person and not a book. That is the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnate word of God. Yet the inference is that, I quote, the horizon of the divine word, that is Jesus, embraces scripture and extends over it. You see, the two, the incarnate word and the written word are put in a relationship whereby the, written, the, the incarnate word extends over the written word. In a rather technical language, Francis goes on to say that the Bible is the, I quote, the canonical memorial that attests the event of revelation. We should unpack this uh, technical phrases. The canonical 
memorial that attests the event of revelation. Each word carries a lot of baggage, a lot of theological uh, meaning. The memorial, it's a memory, canonical, confined to the decision of the church related to the list of, of books, inspired books, that attests, is an attestation, a testimony, the event of revelation, the evidential understanding of revelation. The sentence needs some theological unpacking, but it's clear that the memorial language coupled with the notion of attestation support the view that there is a gap between the Bible and the Word of God. There is nothing original in this account. It has been the theological standard theology of the Word advocated by the Catholic Church since Vatican II. And following, <coughs> uh, the, the, the address by Pope Francis also refers to uh, a very important uh, subject that has to do with the relationship between Scripture and the Church. Once the identity between the word of the Bible is refused and substituted with the dynamism of the living revelation that exceeds the Bible, there stems the need for an arbiter that is able to recognize the living word in and beyond the Bible. While Protestant liberalism submits the Bible to the final judgment of conscience or reason, Roman Catholicism believes that the magisterium of the Church has ultimate authority in the judgment. This is what Pope Francis uh, believes as well. In quoting Vatican II, he says that, quote, all of what has been said about the way of interpreting Scripture is subject finally to the judgment of the Church, which carries out the divine commission and ministry of guarding and interpreting the Word of God. Of course, here Francis is recalling the Roman Catholic view that there is a profound unity between Scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, the triangle interplay, the triangular interplay between scripture, tradition, and magisterium is always in view here. To the extent that one cannot be pitted against the other, two, and vice versa. The critical, critical point here is that the magisterium represents the only living voice of the word, whereas the Bible is a written document the magisterium is a living voice, and what we hear now is the living voice of the magisterium, not so much the mute word of Scripture. Again, the Pope quotes Vatican II <coughs> when he says that, quote, it is not from scri sacred Scripture alone that the Church draws her certainty about everything which has been revealed. Therefore, both sacred tradition and sacred Scripture are to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of loyalty and reverence. We come to the last document that we're going to refer to, and it was the document that Pope Francis alluded in his address to the Pontifical Biblical Commission, which had just released the document entitled The Inspiration of and the Truth of sacred scripture. And this is the most recent document uh, coming from magisterial Roman Catholic theology on the topic. So we have seen Vatican II, 65, followed by almost 50 years of relative silence, and then from 2010 up to now, a number of significant documents referring to the topic. So, meaning that the Catholic Church is actually intensely and actively uh, interested in developing, reaffirming, nuancing uh, its own teaching on, sc of script on Scripture. This is very interesting. <coughs> the title well captures the discussed topic, the inspiration and the truth of sacred scripture. 
It is a lengthy document, 250 pages. A book, a monograph, we would say. And it is basically an al elaboration of what Dave Verbum, Vatican II, had argued as far as the scope of biblical inerrancy is concerned. Vatican II, at paragraph 11, taught that the Bible, addressing the issue of inerrancy, that was, by the way, addressed even by Leo XIII, endorsing a full view of the Bible's inerrancy. High view of inspiration, full inerrancy of the written text. The problem of Leo XIII, I recall, was that the Bible was not the final nor the ultimate authority. But as far as the high view of inspiration and the inerrancy of the Word of God, the Bible was concerned, Leo XIII was very close to, say, B.B. Warfield or the Princetonians. But Vatican II wanted to modify, significantly modify, the scope of that inerrancy. And at paragraph 11, Vatican II, De Verbum, taught that the Bible teaches without error that truth which God wanted put in the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. That's a qualifier of what Vatican II understand as far as inerrancy is concerned. It is not a, an unlimited inerrancy, it is not a full inerrancy, it is an inerrancy qualified by this statement, for the sake of our salvation. The Bible is inerrant as far as it teaches us what pertains to salvation. What, though, is the significance of relating inerrancy to the sake of our salvation? Is it then a kind of inerrancy that is limited only to the message of salvation? What about the rest of the Bible? Is it without error in its fullness, or is it just without error as far as the message of salvation is concerned? But what is beyond that message is not covered by the property of it being inerrant? And how can that which is related to salvation be distinguished from the rest? And who can discern what is without error and what is instead disputable or disputable? Roman Catholic theology has been discussing these issues since, since Vatican II. Vatican II introduced that qualifier for the sake of our salvation, but did not explain what that qualification meant. Now, the Pontifical Biblical Com Commission, after six, uh, 50 years, went back to Vatican II wanting to highlight what that qualification meant, or at least means, for the Commission. The document attempts to reaffirm and expand on what De Verbum highlights. The truth of the Bible is affirmed, but is related, and I quote a series of um, expressions used by the document, it is related to the project of salvation, paragraph 3, or the salvific plan, paragraph 4, or our salvation, Paragraph 63. The detailed biblical overview on the truth of, truth of Scripture is understood as limiting the inerrancy of the text to its soteriological purpose. As for the rest, I quote, In the Bible we encounter, these are words found in the document, In the Bible we encounter contradictions, historical inaccuracies, unlikely accounts, and in the Old Testament there are precepts and commands that are in conflict with the teaching of Jesus. Paragraph 104. More specifically, the Abra Abrahamic narratives, the Abrahamic narratives are considered more as interpretations than historical facts. The pa patriarchal narratives are more interpretations than historical facts. 107. 
the crossing of the Red Sea is more interested in actualizing the Exodus than reporting its original events. 108. Most of the book of Joshua has little, little historical value. 127. And Jonah's story is an imaginary account. 110. In the New Testament, the reference to the earthquake in the Passion's narratives is a literary motif rather than a historical report. Number 120. More generally, the Gospels have a normative value in affirming Jesus' identity, but their historical references have, I quote, a subordinate function. 123. In other words, the theology of the Gospels is valid, but their historical reliability is less important. How the two aspects can be neatly distinguished is not explained. In the end, the truth of the Bible is restricted to what it says about salvation. As for the rest, the Commission is not endorsing a full view of inerrancy. Rather, it introduces large portions and sections of critical thought and reconstruction as far as the reliability of the accounts of the Bible are concerned. Another section of the document deals with the ethical and social issues raised by the alleged truth of the Bible. For instance, the theme of violence and the place of women. The hard and offensive texts of Scripture for instance, the conquest narratives and the imprecatory psalms are not read in Catholic services due to pastoral sensitivity. The Commission says these texts are not read in the liturgy due to pastoral sensitivity. 125. According to the document, how can they be the Word of God is difficult to say. Again, the standard criterion to discern the inerrancy of the text is to, I quote, look at what it says about God and man's salvation. That's the prism, that's the lenses through which they interpret the inerrancy of Scripture. As, mu as, as much as it talks about God and His salvation, that inerrancy applies. But when the Bible goes beyond talking about the salvation of God, it is not applicable as a criteria. Looking at what it says about God and man's salvation, but leaving the rest to the historical critical readings and cultural sensibilities of the time. In a telling final statement, the document says that, I quote, the goal of the truth of Scripture is the salvation of believers. 144. The implication is that the Bible is that the Bible says what the Bible says beyond salvation, however defined, is not to be taken as necessarily true in the same sense. What about the role of the church in this matter? Since the truth of the Bible is not plenary but needs to be discerned according to its salvific purpose, it is the church that mediates the acceptance and the proclamation of the truth of sacred scripture. 149. It is the church that selects and limits what is the truth of scripture. According to the document then, the Bible is true as far as its message of salvation is concerned, but also as far as higher criticism dictates. Ultimately, it is the church that defines the truth of Scripture and rules over it. The Pontifical Biblical Commission's document, The Inspiration on the Truth of Sac Sacred Scripture, the, l the latest uh, document on the Bible by a magisterial commission, argues for a limited inerrancy of Scripture, limited to the message of salvation, and reiterates historical critical views 
about the unreliability of the historical accounts of both the Old and the New Testament. It is a Roman Catholic blend of traditional and critical views of the Bible which finally exalts, exalts the role of the Church. While rejoicing for some fruits of the biblical renewal that is taking place in Roman Catholicism, as far as, especially as far as the encouragement to all to read the scriptures is concerned, the battle for the truth of scripture still rages. In no way has Rome come closer to sola scriptura, that is the obedience to the self-attesting word of God written that truly witnesses to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Roman Catholicism has nuanced its position and has relaxed the sharp edges of its opposition to sola scriptura, but still maintains the prominence of the Church over the Bible. Thank you very much. We're going to take a few minutes of questions. Do you want the questions from the mic for the recording? You got that? All right, so we've got the microphone right here. Uh, so a few minutes for questions. Let me begin, Dr. Carrigo. You were, you were very careful in not using words like fallible or there are errors in the, um, the historical uh, scriptures. Um, although you're using terms like currently they're saying there's contradictions, are there actually within the teaching body of the Catholic Church that are saying there are errors in the Bible? No, not in this explicit way, but um, <clears throat> the, what comes out of especially the most recent document of the Pontifical Biblical Commission is that uh, while it is not directly said that the Bible contains errors, it is said in a negative way. It, it, not all what it says is to be put under the rubric of inerrancy. So it is a nuanced way of saying the same thing without saying directly the word error, referring to the word error. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 a further point is that the what I find very important is the 1943 encyclical by Pius XII, the opening of the historical critical readings of scripture. Although in 43 very nuanced, very moderated, very uh, uh, nuanced and uh, initially endorsed uh, as being one of the driving forces that has eventually led to the 2012 or 14th document by the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Once you, once that door was opened, it became very open to the point of becoming the prominent uh, framework out of which the present-day magisterium sees uh, the relationship between the Bible and its inerrancy. Thank you very much for uh, really a fascinating and, and stimulating uh, paper. Uh, I've, you know, as I've talked with you, you know, living in the 16th century myself, <laughs> um, it's, it's always fascinating this idea of both the, the threads of continuity and discontinuity going back to the Reformation. That, that I, it endlessly fascinates me. Um, really curious of your thoughts on um, I, I like the way that you you framed the distinction within modern day Roman Catholicism of uh, the the Word of God from the Scriptures, yeah. um, and how you you mentioned that there are a myriad of ways in which the Word of God is understood. Things as basic as the way the Catechism stirs about faith in an individual, and the way in yeah. which um, we manifest love and good deeds to our neighbors and stuff. So um, I. It might be helpful. Could you speak to the way in which, if that is the word of God, then that is a very polyvalent way of thinking about not just a voice, but voices. Yeah. So how does Roman Catholicism 
in the 21st century square with when those voices compete with one another and what is then the final authority if they're saying this is the word of God, is it just fall back on the the magisterium at that point or how do they, how do they deal with that? Well, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, (coughs) Let me put it this way. There are, there are legitimate ways of embracing different trajectories, interpretations, voices, uh, views, and in this way the Catholicity of the Word of God is affirmed. The Catholicity of the Word of God uh, basically means that there are different, several uh, streams, voices, sources of the Word of God. But ultimately that Catholicity needs to be related to the Roman voice unified uh, according to the office, the teaching office of the church that ultimately needs to gather all the voices and make, uh, needs to make sense of all those voices uh, impeding that those voices become a cacophony or a explosion of arbitrary uh, voices but making th- making sure that they are they maintain their f- their plurality in the form of catholicity but not at the expense of the uh, final uh, um, magisterial uh, interpretation of the of the, of the of the of the teaching office so just to follow up then on that because what vatican II also did was it it asked and invited the laity yeah. to participate more yeah. in the discourse. So yeah. is that just a tension or is that a, is, was Vatican II being disingenuous with the way it's, it's inviting the laity to the vocation of, of participation in ministry, yeah. really? No, no, no. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, purposely uh, opened up. This way was purposely opened up. But uh, the Vatican II also reaffirmed that the ultimate... Uh, office of the magisterium of the church is the one who has received the task of uh, unifying, codifying, uh, preserving, maintaining, safeguarding. So it opened up more vo- uh, the possibility for more, more voices to participate, but not at the expense of renouncing uh, the role to the role of the traditional role of the Catholic Church to be the final and and. Um, uh, this is perhaps one of the reasons why uh, the Catholic Church, the, the mm, Pope John Paul II, and through the pen and the mind of the then Cardinal Ratzinger, came to the point of uh, feeling the need for an authoritative, comprehensive uh, presentation of the Catholic faith, namely the Catechism the 92-94 Catechism of the Catholic Church. Because once you open up uh, to a plurality of voices, the end result is that you end up in a, uh, in a concert or in a confusion. And so the Catechism was the at- an attempt to say, okay, that is all fine, but we need a unified, codified, authoritative, comprehensive account of the Catholic faith that needs to counter the explosion of voices. And that has been, I see these dynamics always going on in, in Roman Catholicism. On the one hand, endorsing and pushing the Catholicity, but then followed by the reaffirmation of the Roman authority. Vatican II was very Catholic, the Catechism was very Roman. Pope Francis is very Catholic, probably he will be followed by a more Roman Pope. And in this way the tension is maintained, not s- never solved. There is no, never a choice, uh, never a decision that this is going to be uh, the only way, but this is the way that affirms the Catholicity and this way needs to be uh, also coupled with the reaffirmation of the Roman authority. and. Uh, the tension opens up for a dynamic to take place. So it's not rigid, it is not pluralistic in the 
in the in, in in the liberal sense, it is Roman Catholic, the Catholic, pluralistic, and yet unified at the same time. And we need to uh, grapple with this uh, inner tension of the system that allows both instead of choosing one. Thank you. That's super helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your explanations of this. I've yeah. really en enjoyed it. Um, I have a question, kind of following up after his question. You mentioned the catechism yeah. as a way of reaffirming. What in the catechism, um, is there anything there that speaks to the inerrancy of scripture? It, yeah, thank you for the question. It only quotes uh, De Verbum number nine, which says that uh, the Bible uh, presents the message uh, without error. The, the, the formulation has not to do with inerrancy as a word, but without error. That's the technical expression used by Vatican II for the sake of our salvation. And it doesn't explain further. It just it limits to quo uh, quoting the conciliar text. And uh, it was then after even the catechism that the Commission felt the need to go back to that expression trying to uh, explain what at least the Commission uh, understood in it and trying to exegete the Council. So it's an, an exercise of internal exegesis of a conciliar document which had, been, had stated that limited view of inerrancy but not explaining it just leaving it as it stood. Now, the Commission says that l l limitation of inerrancy means that you know many of the Old Testament accounts are not to be taken as historically reliable. It means that even in the Gospels there are literary motives that do not square with historical precision and so on and so forth. There are moral commands that in the Old Testament contradict the teaching, clearly contradict the teaching of Scripture. So there is a whole biblical theology there o o of some sort that tries to uh, make sense of what Vatican II said about for the sake of our salvation. And now it is clearer what that limitation means. It not only means the focus on salvation, it also means the negation of the historical reliability of Scripture, which, by the way, Leo XIII had affirmed, but had affirmed in generic terms, not making examples. So there, this is the way in which the Pontifical Biblical Commission says we're not contradicting Leo the 13th because Leo the 13th was not specific in saying the exodus is the reliable account of what really happened it only limited itself in saying the accounts of scripture the text of scripture is historically reliable and in this general sense mm, even the pontifical biblical commission of today can say yes there is a sense in which it is reliable, but limiting itself to what it says about our salvation without feeling uh, in contradiction with previous teaching. It's both hands. It's an ongoing uh, dynamics take, taking place within Cath the development of Catholic teaching that is reaffirmed and yet, uh, and yet developed without being renounced. It's this dynamics that... Uh, takes place all the time. That actually answered my second question yeah. very well. Um, if I can just ask one more as far as this is from what you described, okay, this is where it's coming from the top. What do you see as the effect on the Catholic churches, like individual churches? Yeah. What is actually taught as far as inerrancy? It is a very unpopular teaching that is now, that is now, uh, uh, this limited inerrancy is, is not popular, is not something that uh, is really uh, taught because it, it, mm, 
the, the tendency, the flow, the driving force is to uh, make uh, the scripture existentially true or ecclesially true but not inherently true not uh, true in themselves so uh, these topics are not and even after the, the 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 document by the pontifical commission i think that for the time being the issue is over as far as the magisterium is concerned and uh, it's a kind of it is a kind of attitude that says okay what we could have said we have said it now mm, we don't we move on in in trying to uh, make the bible uh, read in existential merciful um, devotional ways not addressing the issue of its truth and and the present day pope is also very much influencing this trajectory by saying that uh, the the whole issue of truth is not a primary concern uh, for the church the primary concern is to show the mercy of god is to show the embracement of god is to show the affirmation of god towards everybody but that going back to that discourse of truth inerrancy is a way is a way of again reiterating something that the church wa wants to distance itself from in terms of developing more embracing catholic uh, ways of expressing the gospel whatever that means now before we leave um, if you could share two or three things that we can be praying for you and your yeah. ministry thank you thank you we uh, in being in being a theologian in rome is a very very interesting uh, situation an evangelical theologian i mean and uh, because uh, we are dealing on a daily basis with um, uh, issues challenges um, opportunities to engage with uh, Catholic theologians, academics, and to uh, be a, a small but hopefully a significant voice that is able to relate to them in a meaningful way, asking the right questions, embodying uh, you know, the right attitude, and uh, uh, being that um, uh, critical presence that uh, can make the system uncomfortable, but in the good sense. And uh, so our task is to be, uh, on the one way, very much into uh, what evangelical theology uh, is all about, but at the same time trying to be also uh, uh, capable of hearing what Catholic theology is saying and capable of finding ways of uh, staying in between in the sense of speaking to the Catholic Church what evangelical theology is all about and trying to understand what Catholic theology is saying to us. Uh, in terms of more ecclesial um, uh, activities and, and, and projects, uh, being an evangelical church, a Baptist church, in a majority Catholic context, and especially in Rome, has its unique challenges because Rome has not been friendly, let's put it this way, uh, towards other non-Catholic minorities in the city. And that has been uh, the case for uh, more than 15 centuries. You know, from when I don't know when you want to posit the, the birth of the Catholic Church, but certainly in Rome, when the Pope, when the Roman Empire, let, let's put it this way, when the Roman Empire ended, in the Western Roman Empire ended, Rome was not left in a vacuum as far as power is concerned. The bishops of Rome, the popes, became the new emperors of the city and claimed, you know, endorsing, absorbing imperial claims, imperial titles and uh, offices and that has been going on from the 5th century up to 1870 
without any significant reformation, revolution, renewal, however you want to call it, and I'm not here uh, saying that you know the revol French Revolution was a good thing. I'm not, and I'm not saying that. Um, I'm not, you know, suggesting a an evaluation of the re on the, of the revolution, but just to say that Rome has never gone through any significant change, and so that has meant an ongoing monolithic, un unchallenged uh, dominion of the Catholic Church on the city. For minorities, that has been impossible to be established, let alone flourish. So now that we have a window of freedom that is only uh, has been going on after Second World War, we have to take advantage of uh, the freedom that we have to plant churches, train believers, uh, and be a witness in the city that will eventually be a used of God to bring about a window of something that has never happened there. A window of biblical reformation, a window of biblical uh, renewal. And so in order for this to happen, it takes the Holy Spirit to work and it takes uh, the body of Christ to, to move in and to take courage of stepping in, in faith, in obedience, by trusting the ordinary means of grace, the preaching of the gospel, the administration of the ordinances, the body of believers, and uh, there are no tricks, there are no secrets, there are no easy recipes, but the ordinary means of grace are those that God has ordained to be the ways in which uh, biblical reformation can take place in Rome too.